one in five men and about one in uh, four ladies will have some type of arthritis. The short-term effects are pain, you've got the swelling, you get the redness. Uh, one way to illustrate inflammation is if you just look at the sensitive part of your forearm and you take your fingernail and you rub it up and down for about 30 seconds, that's not a big deal. But you see the tissue gets red underneath it. But if you were to do that for 30 minutes or 30 days, the response to that small amount of, of force on the skin would be very different. And that's kind of what you see. Now, ultimately in joints, you, you see some immobility. And then the long term is you start to see a destruction of the joint tissue. And there are several tissues that make up joints. And Dr. Sumko will talk a little bit about that because that's what he's really designed to help. So one way to address arthritis is through exercise. And what is exercise? It's nothing more than controlled stress. You're just stressing your body, the systems of your body, and there are different types of exercise. And we're not going to go into all the different types of exercise. We're going to talk about some specifics. But it really is about controlling the amount of stress that you apply to your body so that it adapts in the way that you want it to adapt. And everybody's just a little bit different, but the principles are all the same. So way back when I was in school, we, we learned about Wolf's Law. He was, and I love the Germans because I married a German girl. And those German girls are tough. And they're really smart. So uh, this physician, uh, I think it was Julian Wolf, Julius Wolf, back in the 1800s, he observed that if you stress bone, if you load bone, it changes and adapts to the stress that you place it under. Now keep in mind, I said exercise is controlled stress. Because if you load bone too much, then you need to see an orthopedic surgeon because it gives under that stress. So the real art to the exercise is how do you control the amount of stress that you're applying to your tissue. So with, with bone, they observed. Now, in, there's what we call the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demands. That was an early, um, in, in exercise science, that was an early principle that they talked about. So we, we know that our tissue will adapt specifically to how we impose the demands upon the system. And then we've got, of course, Bill Belichick's law. You guys don't know who Bill Belichick is? His law is the strength of the wolf is in the pack. So keep in mind that one of the things you want to do with exercise, we'll talk about this a little bit more, is have a partner and have someone that you can work with that can encourage you, that you can talk to, that you can bounce ideas off of. So the different kinds of mechanical stress, we've got compression, tension, shear. Shear is one of the, st uh, the stressors that can create problems in the back, but it's also one of the stressors that can help a joint heal. Because joints, the end of the bone, if, have you ever popped off a chicken leg and you see that white, shiny stuff? Well, that's the articular cartilage part. And that will, will, it does grow. There are cells, the, the, uh, the chondral class that create our t uh, cartilage cells grow through a certain amount of compression and gliding. So that's where movement of joints can be really helpful in, uh, in especially joints that have some measure of arthritis. So we're gonna talk about how you kind of tease that out and how you respond to how much arthritis you have. And then you've got bending, torsion, and of course, some fatigue. There's a lot of factors that affect how you respond to exercise. So we have a pretty diverse group here, different ages, different sizes, different genders, and each of us will respond differently. We're gonna talk about what the common elements are, and then later on I'm gonna give you some exercises, and I'm gonna give you some choices to start with in terms of exercise. Uh, one of the things that's really important is the psychological and cognitive factors in exercise. You know, I come up here and Kelly gets to talk about chocolate, I talk about exercise. And what happened? Everybody immediately groaned, right? Because it's work. But it's not always work, and you, you, there are ways to make it fun. It is always work. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to mislead you. Um, but it, it can be fun. All right, I'm not going to go over too many of the principles. I'm just going to show you there's a lot of principles 
individuality, trainability, specificity, uh, progressive overload, how you create variety, uh, how much rest do you get, uh, what's maintenance exercise versus trying to grow and get strong, um, what the ceiling effect is. So the basic, the, the way I summarize this with people is the most important principle of exercise is our aim is to do a little bit more today than we did yesterday. So I didn't do any exercise today, so tomorrow is gravy for me, right? If I show up and I do some exercise, I'm going to be doing more today than I did yesterday. The aim is when you're dealing with joints that are inflamed or painful, and I presume that's why people are here, because you have some joints, your hips or your knees are, are, are painful, you want to make sure you do a little bit more and then we gauge your response to that. And we're going to talk about what those activities can be. There are just some pictures. We talked about the, the articular cartilage. This is a picture of the right knee with the kneecap pulled back. So there are some other different types of cartilage in the knee. Everybody's heard of the meniscus. That's the cartilage that kind of cushions the knee. Well, in arthritis, that can get damaged. Uh, sometimes it gets damaged first, and then you have some arthritis. Sometimes you have some arthritis, and then the meniscus gets involved. Uh, you know, it's the chicken and the egg thing. Uh, you also have your kneecap. Uh, how many in here have a knee that pops on them? Yeah. Yeah, so you hear pop. There's some really good research uh, just recently uh, rating the so uh, the the, the, le the volume of noise coming from a knee, trying to correlate that with the path pathology. So some of us have knees that kind of crunch a little bit when you move it. Some of us have knees that will pop. You know, you stand up and you hear that snap and pop. The question is, what is that? And sometimes it's the kneecap. So you see, this, you see the groove in the femur here on the top picture? And then this is the backside of the kneecap. Sometimes it's the kneecap that is just a little bit unstable that's causing the popping. And oftentimes we see that. Sometimes it is, you know, so people say, oh, it's a, I have severe arthritis because my knee makes noise. Well, it does mean that you probably have something going on, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't move and exercise. And when we go over the exercise, I'll talk to you about that. Uh, I wanted to put the picture of the anatomy of the hip. So you see the ball and socket of the hip but you also see that the hip is connected to that flare of the hip. That, that, that half of that pelvis is actually three bones that when you're a baby kind of fuse together. And you see how the hip articulates with your sacrum and it articulates with your back. So how many started with knee pain and ended up with back pain? Yeah. And how many people we see walking like this? I, I actually... Uh, tore my meniscus fishing. Yeah. Yeah, my doctor said I should come up with a better story, too. He's like, <laughs> but what was happening is uh, I went, I started fly fishing several years ago, and I, my wife gave me permission to go by myself. So I thought, I'm going up there all by myself. I can stay on the river as long as I want. Spent six hours on the river. You know what river rock is like walking on, so it's very unstable. So my femur, which is the, the, the shin bone, is planted and, and it's twisting and I'm walking and I'm trying to catch fish and I wake up the next day and my knee completely swells up. So I'm a physical therapist for 35 years, so I don't need anybody's help. I'll deal with it on my own, right? <laughs> so I'm trying to rehab it. I'm not doing a good job. My back's starting to hurt. My hip starts hurt. My hips, how many have a snapping hip? Anyone have a snapping hip? Yeah, you get that snap in the front of the hip? Yeah. So I start walking differently, and I'm going to show you a picture of the iliopsoas muscle because that's an important one. So that's typically, as you start walking and you get that typical gait where you tend to lean over every time you take a step, and that muscle starts to get tight. And we sit a lot, so then our other hip flexors get tight. And next thing I know, I see, I, literally I'm in the gym, and I see a physiatrist that I know real well, and he looks at me and he says, Jeff, you look miserable. I'm like... Well, thank you for saying that, because I am. So long story short, went through a process of, of helping my knee. That helped my hip, helped my back, got back on my exercise. So keep in mind that if oftentimes knee, hip, arthritis can lead to back pain, can lead to a decreased motivation to want to exercise. Uh, as you don't get up and exercise as much, your balance starts to be affected. There's a direct correlation between our balance and our, the length 
of our life because if we're not getting up as often, if we're not getting up as often, we're not drinking as much water because who wants to get up and have to go to the bathroom? Fill up, go to the bathroom every two minutes when it's hard to get up and walk. So th there is kind of a, a cascade of events that can start to happen. So hopefully we can show you how to do, kind of interrupt that. I want to show you this picture. You've got your knee, you've got your, um, your gluteus maximus, your, your hip muscles here. Then you've got your IT band that comes and attaches to your knee. That's a hip and a knee muscle. And that's often the reason why people that have hip and knee arthritis have pain on that outside of the leg or get real tender there. Or you can develop a bursitis when you sleep on that side. Okay, so all those muscles are attached. The calf muscle attaches to the back of your knee. That's why we're going to show you an exercise to stretch your calf. It's really important because it, the calf muscle is actually a, a knee muscle and an ankle muscle. So when you see some of these exercises, and the, the exercises for the hip and the knee are very similar. So all of these that I'm going to show you today uh, carry over for both hip and knee. So the first thing is to have a plan. So the most basic way to have a plan is to do more today than we did yesterday. And keep trying to build on that. I also encourage people to write down what they're doing for exercise. Because when you have arthritis, you have pain, right? Pain is defined. These are the guys who do nothing but study pain. They're really smart guys. And they define pain as an unpleasant emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. So you don't even need to have tissue damage for pain. When we have arthritis, we know that we have tissue damage. But it is an emotional response on every level, even though there's damage. And the example I like to give, what is your name? Bob. So I'm, I'm giving my talk on pain to Bob, and I whip out a needle, and I jab him in the thigh with it. Yeah, and I laugh, and everybody laughs, and Bob doesn't laugh. Because he's been traumatized, and he's been assaulted, right? He has been assaulted. Yeah. So the pain and inflammation is going to be much different than if Bob comes in to see me and I'm a physician and he says, I want my vitamin B12 shot. And I take the same exact needle and I put it in the same exact part of his thigh, creating the same tissue damage. No different. The only difference is the emotional experience that he's had. So there's a lot of things that impact pain. We can also influence pain, and one of the best ways to influence pain, and, and uh, Kelly did a great job talking about decreasing the inflammation through food. One of the best ways we can influence pain is through movement and exercise. So the idea, movement is in fact life. The more we move, the more life we have in our tissue and in, our, in ourselves. So everybody's going to be a little bit different. So part of the plan is not to compare. We don't compare what your sister's doing, what your brother's doing. Have a, that's where having a partner is important, someone can offer you encouragement, but not to compare what one tolerates versus another. Go ahead. Yes. Absolutely. So I get, I'm going to give you some choices here. And ha, if, do you have access to a pool? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. So we're going to talk about, so there is a progression. So we deal with a lot of conditions of people who can't walk. Uh, and the first thing we do is you can exercise lying down first. Now lying down exercises aren't as challenging to your system because they don't work your heart and lungs as much, but it's a good place to start and to be working. Then you move to sitting up. Then you work towards standing up and walking, and you limit the amount of time you're standing and walking. And then there's any number of ways to unweight you. Sometimes we'll even hook people up to some weight to literally unweight their bodies while they're working or uh, getting on the exercise bike. So there's a lot of ways to, to minimize the stress because exercise is controlled stress. So you can control that stress in many different ways. The other thing to keep in mind is fatigue. So when you fatigue, one of the things you want to make sure, so a couple things can influence pain, your nutritional level, your hydration level, how tired you are, the, the amount of emotional stress you're experiencing, all that stuff kind of in your, in your limbic system 
there's an area for pain because that's where pain is processed is in your in your brain so when people say are you tell me pain is all in my head absolutely it's all in your head even though there's a stimulus in your foot so what happens is in your limbic system there's an area and once that area is full it's going to overflow so if you're having an argument with your spouse and you're late on your bills and you have arthritis in your knee, it's going to take much less stimulus to create the pain. So keep that in mind. So making sure that you listen to the level of fatigue that you have, you're staying hydrated and you're getting good nutrition. Okay, That's going to be important for any recovery of any exercise program. Okay, So one of the best things that you can start with with hip and knee arthritis is the stationary bike. Now, there are some people that have a hard time with the stationary bike even. So we have an upper bike, you know, so there, there are different, each person is different. But in terms of impact on the joints, this is a good way to work your heart and lungs, particularly with the hip, sometimes if you don't have enough mobility, but you wanna adjust the seat correctly, but it really is a good exercise. Okay, so let's take out your handouts. So one of the principles is to record what you do. So I gave you a card to record what you do. Okay, and you see, we use this one in the clinic. So we break it up into flexibility and some strengthening. If you can add some cardio exercises, that's really important too. But the challenge when you have hip and knee arthritis, how do you work your heart and lungs? Is you work your, your bigger muscles it pumps blood to your heart, your heart pumps them out. So that's how you challenge your heart, usually. If you can't do that, then there are other ways to do it by doing uh, circuit routines, working your arms, doing rep repetitive weightlifting with your arms, light weights, many repetitions, uh, slow pace, but you give yourself minimal rest. So if you have any questions about that in terms of getting cardio fitness, uh, let me know specifically. We can deal with that one-on-one. -on -one. But the, the typical way is by doing, uh, getting on the bike. Oh, that's my, that's a little early. That was, uh, um, so take out your cards. So we write them down, flexibility and strengthening. Um, what I want you to do in each of these exercises is I've categorized them. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So let's just take a look at A. A, B, and C are flexibility exercises. So we try to minimize them because if you do, the reality of it with home exercise programs is honestly most people just don't do them. I mean, the research on cardio, uh, cardiac rehab, these are people that have had heart attacks, that have almost seen the face of God, and their compliance rate is about 15%. So it's minimal. And when you have pain in your hip and knee, it's even harder to want to do them. So I, again, I'm not trying to shame anybody. I'm just saying that's just the reality of it. it is, it's hard. When my knee was hurting, it was, it was hard to want to exercise. But what I want to encourage you is that the more you move, the better you'll feel within reason, depending upon the individuality of, of what you got going on in the joint. At some, and that's like I said, Dr. Sumko will talk about when you get to the point where you just can't move anymore. But early on in the process of, of joint inflammation, the more you move, the better you'll feel. Not just emotionally, but physically. Yes. Yes, that's right. Like banging your head on the wall. It always feels good to stop. Yes. So what I want you to do is take out your sheets. So we've got, I want you to pick just to start. You're not to do all of these initially, but just to pick one. So look at, look at A. A shows you, uh, you know what, my bad. I mislabeled it. So look at exercise one. Yeah, that's right. So A is a seated calf stretch with a towel. So you got exercise one, exercise two, and exercise three. Those are three different ways to stretch out your calf muscles. One of them is with the belt while you're seated in the chair. The other one is while you're standing against the wall, and the other one is standing, standing with a towel under your foot. Now, you could also do the belt while you're lying down. 
There's any number of ways to do it. I wanted to just pick three to say, if, for example, you have difficulty standing, then you can do the one while you're seated. Okay? So you want to pick one of those. Stretching muscle. Now, keep in mind that muscle has a lot of elastin in it. So if I, if I disconnected, it was Bob, right? If I disconnected Bob's Achilles tendon, I could probably stretch it to me. So when you're stretching that calf muscle, you're stretching a lot of tissue. But the key is when you're stretching your calf, you want to feel it in your calf. And what you're doing is you're inhibiting that muscle and you're getting it to relax and you're increasing the circulation to that tissue. Okay? So with all of the stretches, you're doing them about a minute and a half total. So people want repetitions. Three repetitions, 30 seconds. But about a minute and a half total to relax, get a prolonged stretch. You feel it in the back of your calf. And then you feel like, okay, that's relaxed, and it actually will start to feel warmer because you're increasing the circulation to that area. Uh, the stretches you should do, these exercises you can do every day because the, the load is low enough that the recovery time is minimal. Again, the one caveat is... If, if one of these exercises, if you have a problem with your knee and it inflames your knee to the point where it's more red, more swollen, and more difficult to stand, then we want to talk about how to adapt it even more. Okay? Because some of the functional things you want to look at is how difficult it is to get out of a chair, going up and down stairs. That's the kind of stuff when that starts to get impacted, you want to step back and say, okay... I need to do something different. The first step would be to watch your diet because by watching your diet, you're going to decrease the inflammation. You might even lose some weight, start to increase my activity level. And then the next step is say, I need to see someone to let's look deeper to see what kind of tissues involved and what, what else I might do. Okay. So then when you look at B, those are hamstring stretches. So you've got exercise five, exercise six. Those are two different ways to do some hamstring stretches. Because again, I showed you that one picture. Your hamstrings are a hip and a knee muscle. And hamstrings get really tight because you're sitting. When we sit a lot, our hamstrings will get tight. That'll pull on our pelvis. That'll put stress on our back. That'll tighten the front of our hip. So again, just applying enough tension on that muscle to get it to relax, to increase your range of motion, can be inhibitory for the pain. Now, if you go to, well, that was hamstring. So then you go to C. I gave you three different hip flexor stretches. Can you see those? Ed, you want to be a demonstrator? Do you know the, the uh, warrior pose? No, Ed. You know, just show me. I want you to show them the warrior pose. Okay, so hip flexors, one of those hip flexors is the iliopsoas. The iliopsoas is a pretty complex muscle because it attaches to your spine. It attach, it can, it, it's actually two muscles, so I want you to look at Ed. Yeah, so let's have you reverse, reverse the hip. There you go. So it, it attaches to your spine. It flexes your hip. It also helps side bend the spine, so to really make it a uh, an intense stretch would be for him to dip his shoulder to the right a little bit. This is the most intense stretch on that list of hip flexor stretches. He's standing up, he's having to balance, and he's putting a lot of force on that hip. But this is a great one to do eventually. So one of the things you can do, let's give Ed a round of applause for coming up. And, he, he didn't even, I did not warn him of that. But that's what he gets for having jury duty today and making me see all the patients. Yeah, Phil. Yeah. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty in, intense exercise. But you see number seven, you're lying on the table and you allow, or your bed, and you bring one knee up to your chest and you allow that, in, the, in this picture, the, the model's right hip is kind of hanging off the bed. The reason you bring your knee up to your chest is to protect your spine. Now, 
I would suspect that there are some people who can't even do that exercise. So even if you don't have it hang on, off the bed, you can have it lie on the bed and bringing that knee up to your chest. And that would be a stretch. So the key is, do a little bit more today than I did yesterday. So it might be you're just lying on the bed, you bring your knee up to your chest, you stretch that one hip. That'll, for some of us that have the snapping hip in the front, that'll help solve that. Okay, so you, now we're at the hip flexor stretch. Now we're looking at some quad strengthening. So our quadriceps, so I showed you the picture of the kneecap. Some of the pain, not all of it, but some of the pain, and early on, the pain that one gets with knee arthritis is you have some swelling, you have some pain, that kneecap becomes unstable. Because the kneecap, if you imagine that femur, it's like the, my knuckles here. There, there's a groove that that, that, that uh, patella or that kneecap glides in. And, if it's, and it's, it's pretty much freestanding. There are some tissues that, that hold it in place. But as those muscles get weaker, it gets a little sloppy in there and it can become painful. So by, by strengthening your quadricep muscles... It can help. Now, there's a lot of ways to strengthen your quadricep muscles. So these exercises here are presuming that we're, not, we're at a pretty low level of strength. And we can talk about how to progress them. But what you'd want to do, and I show you pictures in exercise 10 and exercise 11. So 10 is a little more aggressive than number 11. Because 10, you can see if I'm sitting here, and hopefully... Oh, it won't pop, but it crunches a little bit. If I'm sitting at the table and I'm moving my foot through gravity, I'm moving the weight of my leg. Whereas, through a, a larger range, whereas number 11, you're just going to put a towel under your knee and you're going to tighten up your quadriceps. Again, that's enough to facilitate that muscle and to get it going, to get your knee moving. So if you choose to do number 11 and you're doing it, it seems easy, and you're doing it for two weeks then you can go to number 10 and do the more difficult one. Does that make sense? So now we look at number 12 and 13. So number 12, you're lying in the position on your back with your knee bent up. And in this case, you see, can everybody see that picture? Is it big enough for everybody to see? Now what... What, you, what the person is doing is tightening up that quadricep muscle and raising the leg up off the bed. So now you're getting the quads and you're working through the hip. Yeah, well, by making sure you keep that, you, that leg bent, that's why you bend that other leg, is to keep the pressure off your back. But you're right, it is helping the back because it's forcing your abdominal muscles to stabilize your spine while you exercise. If you can't do the leg raise because of pain or weakness, then the next one is you're just going to lie on the bed and you're just going to tighten that quad up. Post-surgically, after, let's say you see Dr. Sumko and you have a, have a knee replacement, one of the first things we do is to try to wake up that quadricep muscle. And people, you'd be surprised, people come in and they can't even do a quad set. And we'll work a whole treatment or two just trying to get that quad to wake up. Well, if you have arthritis and pain, that quad may not have been working properly for many years. So just being able to contract that quad and feel a good contraction there is going to be enough to start to pull that kneecap into its groove and decrease some of your pain. There are simple exercises, but they can be very helpful. Okay, so that would be the quad set number 13. So one of the things we see, and it's true of me too, is we get tight here, we get tight in our hamstrings, and we start to lose our butts. All right? We start to get weak in the glutes. And when those glutes get weak, now you're starting to transmit the stress. And instead of each time I take a step, big, thick glute muscles, if my glutes are kind of wimpy and flat, they don't pull properly. So we want to work on the Bunzo Steel program where we're working on those glutes. So that's what these exercises are for. So if you look at the, uh, the sideline hip abduction, that's a really hard exercise for most people. Okay? It's actually, this is one thing, it's actually easier to do the one standing. 
Okay, if I'm lying, imagine me lying on my side and I'm raising my leg against gravity, that's a lot more challenging exercise than if I'm standing and I'm just bringing my leg back and waking up that glute muscle. So one choice might be to do that one first, standing, if you can stand. If you have problems with this hip and knee, unilater unilateral standing can be problematic too. So doing that one in the pool can be helpful. So I gave you a couple of choices there. Actually, I gave you four choices. And then number 18, if you have a TheraBand, that's a good way to do that one. And then the last one, which is a really good exercise, is the bridging. I would have you all try to do the bridging, number 19, at home. Make sure you do a good pelvic tilt where you flatten that back and then you lift your hips up off your bed or off your floor, if you can get on the floor, and you squeeze your glute muscles. You feel it in your buttocks and hamstrings because what's happening is you're stretching your hips while you're tightening your glutes and you're working your quads. So it's kind of a three-in-one exercise, but it is a real challenging exercise. So try it, and if it hurts you can back off. Okay, so those are your exercises. Uh, and then I put a couple on the last page of the most challenging ones. Uh, the single leg, if you look at number 20, that's a single leg bridge. That's a really challenging exercise. Uh, I've worked with some athletes that their glutes have gotten so weak because they're so quadricep dominant that they can't do a single leg bridge. I was working with a guy who did the caber toss, you know that in the Highland Games? This guy was, he was really built, but he had very weak glutes and he couldn't do a single leg bridge. Uh, so that's a challenging exercise. And then the last one is a wall squat, which is really challenging, but it's a good way to work where you're, you're literally leaning against the wall to support your back. The key for that one is to make sure you're pushing through your heels and your knees are not coming over your toes. I've put the sets and reps in there number of sets, number of reps, those are always suggestions. If you start to do, uh, you start, you practice the bridge and you do five bridges and your knee and hip are hurting, then that's where you stop. If you do five bridges and your buttocks is burning, then you try to do 10. So you want to feel it in the muscle that you're working, not in the joint. Does that make sense? Okay. That's right, you can do the rubber ball, they, and at the gym they have the leg press. The principle is always the same. Push through the heels, squeeze your buttocks, and don't let the toes come over your, your knees come over your toes. Okay, so what I want you to do is you've got your, your sheets, pick some of these exercises, and just start doing them every day. If you can only do a half the repetitions, then only do half and count those. I would think you want to spend 25 to 30 minutes exercising every day. 25 to 30 minutes uh -huh. day. If you picked one of these and went through it, it would probably take you about 30 minutes. If you took your time, you did all the repetitions, it, you minimize the rest in between. Absolutely. And it's a direct correlation, yes. You know, I, yeah, he'll know that one. And I used to know that one, and I just know that, yes, there is. And, and one of the things we try to do at our office, our promise in our office is to, with unconditional positive regard to meet people where they are and help them move forward. So we treat a lot of people that have back, and there's a direct correlation between excessive weight and back pain. And people know that when they come in. They, you know, I've had people come and say, I know I'm fat. And I say, okay, well, I, whatever it is, we're going to help you move forward. You can still be overweight and fit, but it certainly will make a huge difference. And once the joints start breaking down, then it, it, it gets to the point where it becomes urgent to start to drop some weight. I just have one suggestion. Yes. 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 And the Silver Sneakers program yes. is an excellent way of 
it is a great way. Yes. You're absolutely right. Yep. So that's a good way to... That's, Yeah, you have to look. If you have a Medicare, some of the Medicare replacements will. All right, any other questions? John? What do you feel about the plank? The plank is a great exercise. It's kind of an all, overall exercise. The challenge is you have to do it if you can't do it properly because it involves your shoulders, your neck, your back, your hip. And if there is a problem doing that, if you, if you don't do it properly, but if you can do it properly, it's a great stabilization exercise. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if you get on the site, are these the only videos that you have a video number? No, we, uh, yes. Most of these will have videos, and if we get your email address, I can email you, the, and I think we're going to get, did everybody give your email address when you registered? Okay, so if you did, uh, I can email you this, and when I email it to you, there will be a link, and then when you click on it, it will demonstrate the exercise for you. So I'll just routinely do that. Whoever, whoever left their email address, I will email you this sheet. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, thanks for your time. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Sumko. He, you're going to really enjoy his, his talk. I've, we've only been working with you for about a year, but his patients love him. He does a great job, and the outcomes that he has is excellent. So give, you, give him your full attention, and thank you for your patience. <laughs>